Hello, this is Kim Doherty, career consultant with the San Jose State University iSchool, and I'd like to welcome you to our career podcast series. Our guest today is Buzzy Bash, who founded Bash Subscriptions in 1995. Um, those of you currently working in libraries may already be familiar with BASH, subscri BASH subscriptions through your own serials acquisitions and management process, and certainly I have followed their work most of my career, so <laughs> I am thrilled to have a chance to talk with Buzzy today. Um, a little bit of, about Buzzy, although he's retired fairly recently from his subscription management company, Buzzy still keeps current with the profession and is, I would say, in demand as someone who can provide maybe a broader context for a lot of the trends that we're seeing today. So I would say think of this conversation as this is us getting to pull Buzzy aside at a conference and ask him a little bit about his experiences and his advice for all of you as you think about starting your careers in the library and information science professions. So with that, Buzzy, welcome and thank you for taking us. Thank you. Well, you're it. more than welcome. I'm okay. pleased to be able to do it. So to start off, could you tell us a little about getting started as a library vendor? Well, I got started. I went to work for Faxon, which uh, many, many years ago, as a uh, assistant general manager. And uh, over the years, worked my way up and became vice president of operations. And uh, had the opportunity then to go down and run Turner Subscription Agency was a fully owned subsidiary, and that worked out really well. And then I went to work, left there after, I don't know, four years and went to work for EBSCO. I did that for about a year and found that culture it just didn't fit. And then I did consulting work with ALA and the different library associations. And then when I found the software and we moved to New Hampshire, I was able to start my own business. And that grew and became a $40 million corporation. Oh, my gosh. Which is, <laughs> which is just amazing. <laughs> amazing to me. Well, yeah, because you basically started it from scratch. But you yeah. had all of the background about the market and the industry and the profession. And, well, and I, I called three librarians, and one of them was, was out in California, Doris Helper. And Doris said, well, you got my order. I said, oh, my God, what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start of it. And I, for those of you students who are listening and wonder how entrepreneurial companies get started, a heck of a lot of them get started the way Buzzy just described. It's sort of, what the heck, take the leap and go for it. Um, but I, I think one of the things, Buzzy, that probably informed a lot of your success is that you had built a reputation well, that's, that's reputation is important. You have to be fiscally sound, but you know, getting the software was an important step. Cool. And once I got the software and the urge to help people, the just fell into place over the years. That's a pretty good combination. And while you were doing that, were you working with both public libraries and academic libraries? No, primarily I started out working with medical libraries, oh. uh, corporate libraries, and then some academics. Okay, all right. Um, so the the next question that I have uh, for you, because I know you've sort of seen a lot of these changes, is what would you say would perhaps were have been the most impactful changes? in the profession, in the industry, say over the past five to 15 years? Well, the surge in electronic journals, that's ah. been a big uh, change. Uh, uh, probably 50% of the journals are growing rapidly is, is electronic today. And more and more, the libraries, the users of libraries, are looking to order their material electronically and not through paper anymore. And that's been a big change. And, and change. from your perspective, did that mean that you had to change how you were doing things? 
Well, you have to adapt. Uh, that's very, very important, being flexible. And what I found was that we were developing a, you know, platforms where where customers could access their electronic material, what they ordered through the agent or what they ordered directly. And once you get that working, then you can seek out more customer, prospective customers and offer the service to them. And it seemed to work. <laughs> I don't sense. know how it did, but it worked. And but it really takes, what's really important is that you have the people. I mean, it, it was never, I didn't feel it was ever me. I felt that it was the people. And, and what you need is brains. You need people that are looking to solve problems. People, because that's our job is to solving problems, whether it be paper or electronic. You know, you have to make sure that the end user is getting them the material that they expected and when they wanted. And that's very, very important. I, I think that's a really good um, point because I know that when I have worked with students and I've talked about working for vendors, which I consider to be one of the coolest kinds of career paths in the profession, mm -hmm. um, people think of working for a vendor as sales. And at, at this oh, no. point, you know, sales is sort of like part of a part of a part, but your point about solving problems is really what then... But what you're looking for is brains. You're looking for people that have the brains to be able to deal with multiple problems, being able to keep the customer happy, be able to keep the end user happy, and the publisher happy. And that's not an easy task, and it takes a lot of brain power to do that. And basically, it's a people world. It's not a computer world, and you have to work with people, and then that's the key requirement. Now, how you find that out in an interview, that's pretty tough. <laughs> that's pretty tough. Now, I've met lots of talks, to, you know, I've given lots of talks at library schools and talked to a lot of prospective librarians, and they have to be into solving problems. They have to be interested in that and find that to be a challenge and of interest to them. Uh, they're not, you know, you don't go to work for a vendor to protect the books, that's for sure. <laughs> So you raise a really good point then, Buzzy, because one of the um, challenges that students have when they graduate from an iSchool or an MLIS program is understanding how to present themselves in an interview situation that makes sense for the potential hiring organization. Sure. They're sort of thinking, I need to say that I know how to do this and I know how to do this and I know how to do this. But what we hear back is, no, what hiring managers are looking for is exactly what you just said. They're looking for people who are adaptable, who that's, have- That's correct. You know, you don't- you don't have to, I mean, technology is very important, and it's certainly been changing over the years. You don't have to be a technologist to be able to deal with problems today. What what you have to be able to be is flexible, and yeah. and that's and, and learn learn from your mistakes or learn as you go along. There's no guarantee that you're going to be a technological expert, and. Well, I don't think the vendors are looking for that. I think what the vendors are looking for is problem solvers, people, people with good minds, and, and that's very critical. I've had people working for me that wanted to be editors, other people that wanted to be children's librarians, and if that's what you want to do, then you don't want to go to work for a vendor. I mean, it doesn't make much sense to go to work for a vendor if you're, you know, your career path or you're looking for you know, walls or uh, a niche to work in. Right. You know, I, I don't know. And and the work that you were doing and that people would be doing with you as employees of uh, Bash subscriptions, were you doing uh, international work or was it mostly yes, in yes. international? No, international and domestic. Okay. The, the focus was on domestic, but we had a major customer in Russia. We had uh, a major customer down in South America. Wow. By the way, most vendors require that their foreign customers prepay. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> you, well, it, it's, you know, I've had, uh, I had one librarian work for me at Bash Subscriptions, and she didn't think customers should have to pay a fee. Well, 
you know, that's how you compensate it. That's how you get your salary. You know, you can't do it for nothing. This, this is an interesting dilemma because as someone who who loves the idea that information should be free, but who has also written a number of books. Um, I really love getting a royalty check. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> my days of royalty checks are over, unfortunately, but yes, no, I can appreciate that. We did a book uh, with Neil Schumann years ago on buying cereals and collected, I don't know, for about 20 years we collected uh, royalties. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a dilemma for librarians because I certainly understand and and uh... well, they're under a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, the the libraries today are faced with issues that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago, and one of the pressures is that the uh, libraries looked uh, certainly academic libraries are looked upon as being cost centers and not producing any income, right. and therefore they should be reduced. Uh, so the administration says, and that's a real challenge. How do you deal with an environment like that? Whereas in, in a corporate setting or in a business, you see if faced with the same issues, you know what are the what are the priorities? How do you set priorities? Okay. Uh, where do where do you put a limited amount of resources? And instead of looking at it, the academics look at it and say, well, we don't we don't need a library. We can go directly, everything's available free on the internet today. Um, I, tough, tough I, I think you're identifying a very um, salient problem, or I would say it's a challenge, and I would say that, that librarians are becoming much more astute um, and effective uh, at countering that mindset, but they are beginning to do it by showing return on investment. Right. Um, and and I think it's taken a while for all of us to get there, but it it is, you know, for example, the difference between something that you would find on the Internet and a serial that's peer reviewed or whatever is night and day. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to be able to articulate effectively that distinction to a chief financial officer in an organization right. or to the provost um, right. at, at school. So I, I would agree that this is a huge issue. I'm, I'm hoping- Well, I, I think that the management, whether it be in a library or in a corporation, are always fighting and challenging as to what the priority should be and where the resources should be placed. I mean, that's, a, that's an ongoing issue. And today, everybody gets involved in it. And then right. certainly, you know, if you get a library degree, what you're bringing to the table is a good head, good brains, and that's a very, very agree. important. I would agree. I, I think if we're um, heading in the right direction, that that is what comes out of a grad school experience um, in, in information work. So, well, so. Let's, <laughs> let me sort of focus you then on that idea. If you were hiring someone today, say this was, um, say, say all of a sudden, I, I, you know, this could be a good thing and a bad thing, but say all of a sudden you were back in charge and you were hiring for a position um, for BASH or for some other um, undertaking, what questions would you be asking? In that's, an interview situation, because that's what a good question. Because I, I personally feel that I haven't been very successful at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult, uh, um, you know. How do how do you know if a person has good brain power, has flexibility? Right. You know, you talk about it and you, and you discuss it with them. And I th I always felt that that the openness is really important. Being open and and. Uh, uh, developing conversation or rapport with the person so that they understand where you're coming from and you understand where they're coming from. Um, it's, it's a, you know, I, I don't have a checklist of questions to ask somebody. Um, it really depends on their background, their experience. You know, do they want to be a, a big fish in a small pond? Do they want to be a, a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a you know, a large point. Right. You know, how do how do you get that out of them? Um, I, you know, and 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 you got to sort of temper your own feelings. <laughs> that's pretty difficult. That's interesting. That's that's a a good point um, because all of us 
in a hiring situation, do bring our own sort of worldview and yeah, your own biases. Too. Yeah, exactly. One of the mm. things that I am seeing happen more and more in hiring situations is people saying, tell me about a situation where you had to deal with this. Or in a hypothetical situation, if you were confronted with X, Y, Z, how would you go about making a decision in that situation? That's, yeah, it sounds good. Um, sounds it, good it's, to me. I, I, I um, would ask questions. You know, I, I try to get as much information in their background, what they're, what they're looking for, what their desire is, what their hopes are. Uh, where, where are you going to go with this? Uh, where do you want to be? What would you like to be? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do you need uh, uh, definition of everything? Uh, oh, can that's you work, a can you be that's flexible. A, yep, that's a great question um, because so much of the work that's going on now, whether you're in a vendor situation or even say a corporate library or in any kind of an emergent organization is um, can you think on your feet? If you need mm -hmm. constant guidance and well, and, and how are they dealing with people? Yes, you know it's a people world, and and basically whether you're dealing with customers or you're dealing internally with the staff, you know how they handle people and what's their track record for people handling. Interesting. You know, that, that's a key element. Uh, it is when you're staffing, when you're trying to build an organization. You know the the uh, can they deal with people that have, you know, everybody has some sort of issues in their lives. That's all part of it. <laughs> Can you deal? <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> it is. And I, you know, what we sort of think of our ideal candidate or our ideal organization. And, and the reality is actually what you just said. Everybody's got issues in their yeah. lives. And, and well, I, I, I have a friend of mine that, that she went to work at a public library as a director, and the previous director was still getting paid and hadn't been in the library in two years. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, God, it was just unbelievable. But that's, you know, different strokes for different folks. <laughs> that's the job we were looking for, Buzzy. <laughs> yeah, that's a job. I'm not sure you'd want it. I would have to say, I don't think I would. It sounds yeah. pretty dysfunctional. No, uh, no. And then, you no. Know, how do how do you get when you hire people? How do you get them to be assertive and and go after additional business and and say you're dealing with medical library? You know, how do you? How do you say, you know, you want to get to the uh, departments and see how the departments are ordering? You know, can you go around that person? If you go around that person, is that the librarian going to get upset? Right. You know, the, right. You know okay. some, some people just have a knack for it. But you can raise that, you know, you said about questions. Well, those are some of the questions that you might ask. The, that uh, that would be great. Employee. Because not only, is that, yeah, not only is that a hypothetical, that's a, you know, a uh, challenge that people would actually be faced with. And mm -hmm. another one um, that I've seen having worked for a vendor is how well do you build relationships? Because customers these days really are relationships. Yes. Um, and, and sort of that's where it starts. And if you're not comfortable doing that, if you're looking more at it, you know, this is just a transaction, I think that's less successful. No, it's always a people. Yeah, I, I always felt it was a people issue. Interesting. You've got to deal with people. Never, never the individual transaction. Transaction is just part of it. You know, it's the mechanical part of it. It's the people part that's important. You know, the learning. The, the most successful people that I've had work for me that were with library degrees are the ones that have been able to deal with people and deal well and, and have a good rapport and sensitive to their needs and and go back to them with questions about their family, about their right. kids, right. you know, their husbands. They really care. You, you know, and digging deeper and deeper and, and um, that's what you do. Uh, you know, you know they, they become part of your organization. And I would have to say, I think you're the best example of how that works because we've been in in the profession for a long time and you're still very much sought out for 
your opinions, for your ideas, and that sort of thing. And I, I from my perspective, that's one of the cool things about this profession. Mm -hmm. That's it, one of the yeah, it's really it, cool. It's great. You just that's keep well, that's why I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I will wrap us up for today, but Buzzy, thank you so much. Okay, if you have more questions or if I can be of additional help, just let me know. Uh, you're on my list. You'll be hearing from us. Thanks okay. so much. You're welcome, Kim. Thank you. Bye -bye.